We are about to begin a study uh, of effects of infection with the 2019 novel coronavirus that causes what everyone knows as COVID-19. Um, this study is uh, focused on an area that many people may not think about when they think about COVID. People who are younger, uh, in the range of 18 to 35 or so, people who are previously healthy, people who did have the COVID-19 disease, but at a mild level, so they never needed to go to hospital. And we're then looking at actually how the virus potentially affected their brain and what those implications might mean for the long run. Now, that is something that may come as a surprise to many people, because again, we don't sort of reflexively associate COVID-19 with brain effects, but actually very early in the pandemic, it became clear that infection with this virus does have effects on the brain. Since the advent of the vaccine and some changes in the SARS-CoV-2 that's circulating, we see less death and severe disease and admissions, which is great news. What the public may not realize is that they can still develop mild COVID and that can result in long COVID. And this is what occurs after recovery from the infection. 60 days, 90 days, six months later, you have persistence of symptoms. And they could be pulmonary, exercise tolerance isn't at the level it was, cardiac or neurocognitive, which typically manifests as loss of memory, unable to concentrate. Some studies say this occurs in 30 to 50% of people who had COVID-19. And what's really interesting is that it can occur in people who had very mild COVID-19 and no other medical conditions. And what is very powerful about the study is Michael Lipton and his group have very in-depth neurocognitive testing and neuroimaging of healthy residents of the Bronx. And so when the pandemic emerged and we started to hear anecdotally that patients were having problems with memory, concentration, we thought we could restudy this group. And this is a very powerful study design because any changes we see, we can attribute to COVID-19. The way we're going to go about doing this is by turning to a cohort of hundreds of patients who were examined uh, and were healthy prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic because they participated in other studies at Albert Einstein and Montefiore. And those are individuals for whom we now have a very clear baseline of what their brain looked like through MRI scans, what some of their blood chemistry looked like and what their brain function looked like. And the reason that we need to study this is that it's going to affect a large percentage of the population. And one thing that we're worried about is if there's any inflammation or damage to the brain, will this result in something that happens 10, 20 years down the line? in terms of loss of neurocognitive function. So we don't know what it means. You have long COVID now, and what are the implications for your health 10, 20 years later on? This kind of study is gonna to start to answer that by asking how does it actually manifest that I can measure in terms of neurocognitive testing, neuroimaging, how long will it last? And in our case, we're studying three years. And the other thing that we're trying to do is develop biomarkers. So from all of our patients, we're gonna collect blood and in patients who have clear changes, we're then going to study to determine if we can figure out blood biomarkers. Again, this can be used to study the general population and we can use them in case we have interventions to see if they're responding to therapy. In designing the currently funded study, we did do some preliminary testing and we know, therefore, that uh, while very preliminary, that there do seem to be some demonstrable trends which show that individuals who had 
the coronavirus infection, and again, were either mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, compared to individuals who did not show a modest but clear decline in measures coming from MRI of their brain structure that are uh, consistent with inflammatory changes in the brain in terms of areas of cognitive function like memory and attention and information processing speed. There is a spectrum of severity. Some people may have, with the same disease, a more severe manifestation. Some may have a less severe manifestation. Some may have the same disease going on in their brain that is actually subclinical meaning they don't notice any symptoms, but it could be at a very low level where the same inflammation is going on, not at a severe enough degree to cause symptoms now, but could be a harbinger of future brain dysfunction down the road. That's why understanding the mechanisms and potentially developing targeted treatment are important to try and, and head off future, obviously, um, clinically significant problems in people who right now may have lower levels of, of change in the brain. What I find interesting about SARS-CoV-2 is this persistence of symptoms. For me as an infectious disease physician, that's very unusual. And we do see in some of our patients that have persistent symptoms, it's really affecting their day-to-day -day life in terms of their thinking, their ability to think, their memory, this feeling of mental fogginess. Some patients aren't able to exercise as they did in the past. And I would tell my patients that as transmission rates rise in your community, you can do something very simple, which is put a mask on. Because we don't know who's at risk for long COVID. So I would suggest keeping an eye on transmission levels in your community, Put that mask on. I think we're all kind of used to it at this point. I would use the N95, uh, which are better at preventing transmission. And if we need to get additional boosters coming in the fall in case rates go up, I would do that. We want to try to prevent being infected. We don't want to have a risk of long-haul COVID. We don't want to infect our family and friends.